So our fearless leader group from from Portland, Oregon, has gone to Portugal. They flew like 18 hours to Portugal, and they came back with some insightful wisdom that we talk about a lot here on News for Reasonable People. Let's get into it. Is it insightful? Nah, it's common sense knowledge. All right, you got this, you got to do this. Let's get into it. Here we go. For those of you who have been following this podcast for any amount of time, this is going to be some pretty, there's, there's one interesting item in here. It's going to be some pretty redundant concepts. It's like, huh. So people that are addicted to drugs that are killing them, they need to, they need to get into treatment. They need to go through detox. Huh. I'm going to, I'm going to have to think about that for a little bit. I'm going to have to work my way through that whole process and see if that makes sense. But uh, hey, thanks for a nice trip to Portugal. That was great. <laughs> Dozens of Oregon lawmakers, law enforcement, and addiction leaders are back from a week long trip to Portugal. Who doesn't want to go on the taxpayer's dime to Portugal, right? Who doesn't want to go there? I, I'd go. I, yeah, even if I'm not intent on really learning much. Yeah, Portugal, you betcha. The county's drug decriminalization was a model for Oregon's, the country's, sorry, Portugal was a model for decriminalization for Oregon's controversial Measure 110. And those who attended the trip say they have come to a clear agreement. Here it is. Here it is, guys and gals. This is, this is the breaking story. This is the breaking news. Give people struggling with addiction places de to detox and get treatment. I know, I know. That is a novel concept. This is this is some earth-shattering stuff. I'm going to sit up straight and I'm going to just read this again to you. Give people struggling with addiction places to detox and get treatment. Huh. Is that because Oregon is the worst in the United States for providing said detox and getting treatment? Yes, it is. Huh. Weird. So you decriminalized drugs. You made them readily available. Got this open southern border. Mexican cartels just bring the drugs right up willy-nilly shenanigans for days. And to the point where literally the Sinaloa cartel right now and another one of the cartels, they are telling their drug dealers, do not sell anything with fentanyl because those prices have gotten so cheap. 25 cents a pill in Portland, Oregon. 25 cents. Yeah, take this, you get super high or you could die. 25 cents. That is the cheap cost of admission to that silly Russian roulette game, right? Give people struggling with addiction places to detox and get treatment. Oh, 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 I had to go all the way to Portugal for that. Well, they also say that Oregon should give law enforcement the tools to nudge people to treatment without recriminalizing drugs and repealing Measure 110. Okay, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? How are you going to get people into treatment? Well, here's the thinking, right? All right, busted you here for open drug use, whatever. Right, it's a misdemeanor, but all right, I'm not going to send you to jail. Got this option here for this drug counselor who wants to get you into detox because it looks like you need it. This might be a better direction for your life to go. So I'm not going to throw you in jail. I'm not going to write you a ticket, whatever it is I was going to do. I'm just going to hand you off to this person. They're going to get you into treatment. You going to take it? Hell to the no, they're not. They just want to get out of whatever, you know, charges they've got going. And they know that the charges are just empty. So this whole tools to nudge people to treatment without recriminalizing drugs and repealing Measure 110. All right. Um, I don't think you need to recriminalize drugs either, but you need to come up with something, some kind of mechanism to get the people the help that they need that are literally dying on the sidewalk, streets, parks, you name it, in, in Portland. Portugal is much more advanced in how much treatment and access to treatment they have when they decriminalized. You mean they thought about it and they had a plan in place? They didn't just willy-nilly do it? Like defunding the police? Hey, we don't have the system set up to take the money from the police and put it in something that we know is going to work, but let's give it a rip anyway. We'll just see how it turns out. Oh, crime went up and 
streets are overrun in cities that um, that decriminalize their police and they don't have enough cops. Huh. Don't have the sexual assault units open anymore because you don't have enough cops to run that division. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. You're shy 600 cops in so many of these big cities. Interesting. I wouldn't have seen that coming. Yeah. <laughs> and we desperately need to make sure that we continue to build out our treatment systems. Well, because they're the worst in the United States. So there's that, right? But that's what happens when you come up with policy. This is going to be great. Measure 110 is going to be the greatest thing in the world ever. We're going to decriminalize drugs. We're going to get a lot of those funding. A lot of the funding for this is going to go right into treatment. Just didn't happen. You don't have the treatment. You don't have the investment. You just thought it was this novel concept idea that is just wildly backfiring. Now you got a bunch of people dying. Oh, didn't see that coming. But Representative Lily Morgan, Republican from Grants Pass, said Measure 110 needs to bring back accountability. That's a Republican for you right there. I mean, that is a racist word, isn't it? Accountability. Oh, racism. Can't have that. Racism. <laughs> accountability. It's, it's like um, another racist word was um, hustle. Another racist word was uh, uh, timeliness. Yeah. I mean, enforcing somebody to be on time, that is, I mean, you can't have that. We still want access to treatment, but the lack of accountability or incentive to get treatment is killing people on our streets, she said. Again, another head scratcher. It's like, really? I mean, you didn't see that one coming? You decriminalize all this and now you got a drug that kills people left and right? Because... You know, they make it a little wonky down in uh, <laughs> down in Mexico and then bring it across the border and killing off our folks. I mean, you, you didn't you didn't didn't see that one coming. No, no. We thought the heroin was just going to be fine. However, Morgan also noted that Portugal is not dealing with the same drugs as Oregon. That is the interesting fact that I think um, needs to be noted. All right, so it worked in Portugal, but you got a new ball game here in in the United States, right? You got fentanyl, you got you got you got trank dope is becoming well known now because people are just getting their limbs amputated left and right. You know, xylazine, it's the trank dope, and basically the point of injection. It you know it, it makes the the skin just die it, the the tissue just dies and so the people get these open sores and infections and you know they get uh oh they just get infested with all kinds of little termites and just not termites because they're not made out of wood but uh <laughs> you know what i'm saying they have been dealing with what they have been at what what would have been a heroin crisis and dealing with the heroin epidemic, but they have not dealt with fentanyl at all. And so we were dealing with a more acute crisis, she said. That is where the United States basically got caught with their pants down because they didn't see this one coming. Hey, decriminalize drugs. What could go wrong with this concept? Well, fentanyl's here. And so everybody's freaking out. That's That's literally what's going on. Oh, good Lord, a drug that kills us? It's unregulated? Huh, weird. But despite their differences, Aaron Schmautz with the Portland Police Association said Portugal's system still comes with its faults. We read about how things are not going very well there. There are articles people refer to. It's just not that simple, he said. It's a country dealing with a lot of the same issues we are. Well, here, listen to what some of those are. In fact, officials who took the trip say they met people who were disappointed when it would take a week for someone to get treatment. One week. Now, if you're not familiar with how treatment system here in the United States works, unless you have a lot of money or unless you have crazy great health insurance, you're not getting into treatment real quick. If you're like so many of the folks that are on the streets, they have zero money. They have zero health insurance. So they're going to go through the state run program, right? And those things are brutal to get people into. Brutal. I mean, and then when, when your spot comes up, you got a Johnny spot, get that person to wherever that treatment is. Could be anywhere in the state, right? Could be anywhere in the state. That's how Washington works. So you got to be able to get that person in your car and drive them to treatment. If that doesn't happen like that, you might lose your opportunity. And that person goes off and, you know, moves their tent or whatever, and then they die. 
Well, that's not the happily ever after story, is it? But that is literally what's going on. And so this notion of one week, that would be great because oftentimes it is way longer than that. And that's if you have a support system of people concerned about this individual not wanting them to die and trying to help get treatment, get them into the detox, get them cleaned up. For most folks on, on the streets in the, in, in the tents, they do not have that, right? It's, it's that very lack of family that got them there. So it's this, it's this horrible system where we're just enabling people. Ah, here you go. Here's everything but the drugs itself. Just make yourself comfortable. Hope it goes well. All right. Get out there and give them hell, son. Meanwhile, Representative Rob Nose, d- Democrat from Portland, said people in Oregon's system often have to wait months. There you go. Right? So things aren't working well in Portugal. Got to wait a week. I mean, that's ideal. That is ideal. If you can do a week. Yeah, you can work that out. Schmout said having more peers available to those suffering from drug addiction could be an asset to the Portland Police Bureau. Having treatment people available with the police when they are there with people who are struggling can say, hey, he can, we can go to jail. We can take you to jail. But here's a treatment person and you don't have to go with me to jail. He said, that's the nudge nudge. That's the nudge part to getting people treatment. Is that going to work? No. And why is that? Because there's this notion that people want to get into treatment and they are voluntarily ready and willing to go. Now, some of them, a very, very, very small percentage will actually take those offers up. You will hear about those stories. You will hear about folks who are like, yeah, it was on my 16th arrest. The same damn cop just kept riding my ass. And that's what got me sober. I got popped again. I had to do a three-year stint. I got sober because of that damn cop. And everybody else is like, defund the police. They're terrible. They're awful. Even so, Schmout said that drug decriminalization in Oregon shouldn't have relied on a singular legislative change. Their process was about 80 bills in Portugal. 80 bills. A two-year process. So, What we learned here is that you have to plan out when you're going to do a major legislative change that is going to rock your society, maybe plan it out just a scooch so you reduce the shenanigans. Now you've got shenanigans running your streets. Huh, weird. But they did it in Portugal. They did it in Portugal and they're fine. Let's go there and take a little trip. Let's go over to Portugal. (laughs) <laughs> it's a lot of work to make sure they had treatment in place, two-year process. I think it was a cautionary tale to make sure that if you're going to carry out a new plan, such as defunding the police, new plan, you want to make sure that you have all these things in place to make sure the system doesn't break. The problem is, is the system is already broken here in the United States. You don't have enough treatment for all these people. Philadelphia, you don't have enough treatment. San Fran, you do not have enough treatment. Oregon, worst ever. Not enough treatment. Not enough places to get people in. Could take months. By then, those folks could be dead. Period. That is the downside. That is the heroin versus fentanyl, right? However, Representative Rob Nose, a Democrat from Portland, is confident the legislature can take on the law enforcement aspect of Oregon's drug crisis. Uh Uh-huh. Really? You're confident? Really? Because things are going so well with law enforcement right now on anything. Yeah. 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 The confident, confident, well, I mean, you might be confident, but I, I don't think other folks are. It was very clear to me that the law enforcement leaders that were before us do not just want to put people in jail. They're not interested in decriminalizing, No said. What they do need is the ability to deal with public use and the ability to confiscate drugs. And I feel fairly confident that the legislature will unite around those topics at a bare minimum. All right. So they are going to unite around those topics and do what? And come up with what solution? You need literally billions of dollars of infrastructure. And you don't have that in your budget. You need to build out these massive systems, get people going. And, you know, and, 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 and these drugs are so addictive. Fentanyl is so addictive. I don't, I don't see a lot of folks even going through treatment sticking with it, right? They always seem to go back on the streets because this stuff is 
50 times stronger than heroin, 100 times stronger than morphine. Remember you always heard about the guys coming back from like World War II all jacked up on morphine? Well, this ain't your granddaddy's <laughs> morphine. My grandfather was a medical doctor in World War II. Yeah, over in Germany. He was a medical doctor overseeing a German officers prisoner of war camp. I mean, some crazy stuff. Morphine. Yeah. I mean, it's what you did, right? It's what you did. Stuff now that we have is wildly more addictive and can kill you just boom. Whereas the whole overdose from, from morphine and overdose from heroin, yeah, but the, the numbers of people dying from that are way, way lower. Remember when you used to hear about an overdose and it was like, wow, no way. Guy over, oh, wow. I heard about an over, somebody overdosed like in downtown. You remember hearing about that? And you're like, oh man, that's terrible. Now it's an everyday occurrence. Multiple people. Multiple people in any big city that's allowed their politics to run this kind of deal. Hey, here in, uh, here in Seattle, we just had a general election. We had an election and uh, seven of nine city council. The final votes aren't in yet, but it looks like every incumbent lost and every position that had somebody a little bit more moderate. I'm not saying any Republicans are going to win. Uh, we're in Seattle. Who are we kidding? But you've got some moderate folks that ran on law and order and safety. It looks like every single one of them will probably win. The big deal with uh, Seattle politics and the way that um, and a lot of these progressive, why is it called progressive? Because there's no effing progress ever. It's, it's just this, you're opening up Pandora's box to a bunch of shenanigans, right? It's just like, okay, okay yeah, let, let, let's, let's give these laws a run and we'll just see how it goes. And it goes sideways and, well, we're going to need to study that some more. But so the way that progressives vote, it's a, it's a known quantity and known voting pattern is that they vote very late in the game. So there's all these progressive votes that come in that they're counting right now. Yesterday was election day. Um, it's also my birthday, November 7th. Yeah. 55. I can't drive 55. Yeah. Hit the 55, the big five, five. So we, we've got all these votes coming in, but I don't think it's going to be enough to sway because a lot of the folks, a lot of the more moderate folks who are running on law and order and public safety, because those are, you know, and the, the drug abuse and the homelessness, those are the major, major uh, you know, ticking points for all of these campaigns, especially in a few neighborhoods where it's just been, it's run rampant. And uh, like Shama Sawant of Seattle is no longer running. And um, a couple of the incumbents that probably had a shot are basically losing oftentimes by double digits, you know, 54 to 46 type, type vote swing. So it's some, some pretty major, all right. We're still not, we're, we're never going red here in Seattle, but we've got a handful of folks now who I think have a little bit more of a moderate approach because we swung so far to the left, so far to the left that I think even the most hardened Seattle citizen is like, yeah, yeah, this, 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 this isn't what we intended. This wasn't, this wasn't what we wanted. And then you've got the jack offs that are like, there's no crime in Seattle. It's fine. Everything's great. It's hunky. There's that. That's just, that's a right wing narrative on the news. And you look at the crime stats and you're like, oh, uh, okay. Well, anywho, what do I know? What do I know? All right. That's it for me on this one. Thanks so much for being here. I will catch up with you on the next one. See you then. <laughs> <laughs>